questions. Yeah. Um, I'm now... just going to let you know and everyone in the meeting that we are now recording our um, lecture series lecture. Oh, right. okay. And we are officially welcoming Mr. Michael Goulden who is a specialist in anaesthetics. Um, and we're really interested to hear what you have to say. You know you're competing with Radio Forcer. They've got oh, a programme on right now right. on right. what is anaesthetics. <laughs> what is anaesthetics? Well, that's an age old question. And uh, yeah. uh, so I've decided to talk about the history of anaesthesia really and how it's developed over time and how that then um, Really, in many ways, it's changed a lot, but it hasn't really changed at all. Uh, that will become clear when um, you see what I'm talking about. So, well, I've, uh, I've just made you a presenter, sir. So, if I share my screen, press that. I'm just wait a minute, shares. I've got to click that again. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a while to work. Double clicking, press it. Oh, there you go. And, uh, Minimize, go in the middle button and minimize that. Minimize that. There we go. And then I want that. If you go on present to view, it looks better. I need to. Do you know how to do that? It just looks really a lot better. Can I show you how to yeah. do it? Mrs. Goulden is is um <laughs> your able assistant. Yeah. <laughs> We're the experts, I don't, I don't aren't use we? Teams very often. Ah, oh, does that look like a full screen now? Yes, it looks great. Thank Thankfully, you. my face isn't on the screen anymore, or or is it still there? It's still there. You're a little oh pin, pinpoint of a figure. <laughs> Never mind. Um, can everyone hear me? I hope so. That's good. So, um, thank you, Mrs. Trafford, for inviting me to speak here. Um, it's a topic obviously very dear to my heart, but also a topic that actually affects us all really. Um, I'm, I'm a consultant in anaesthesia and pain management at the Royal Liverpool University Hospital, um, uh, but I'm also an examiner for the Royal College of Anaesthetists in London. So we examine anaesthetists in training to, to ensure have very high quality standards of anaesthesia in the UK. Um, and probably every single one of us at some point in our life, even if it's a minor procedure, just as a, having a tooth extracted or uh, some sort of small break in an arm or whatever it is, but most of us encounter uh, anaesthetists at some point in our lives, hopefully successfully, um, without any major issues. Um, so it's a broad-based specialty that really has impacted uh, modern medicine in a in a huge way. So my background is I was born in the salubrious borough of Bootle in Merseyside uh, in 1966, the same year that England won the World Cup. Um, other famous, I don't know whether the children are interested in football, but the other famous character from Bootle is Jamie Carragher who has got the record number of appearances for Liverpool Football Club. So uh, you're in esteemed uh, uh, company here from people from Brutal. It's just north of Liverpool, uh, if those of you who don't know where it is. I did my undergraduate medical education at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne, 1985 to 1990. And what some people maybe misunderstand about anaesthetists is anaesthetists are fully qualified doctors. They do exactly the same training as every other specialty uh, and then do move into the specialty of anaesthesia in a, from a postgraduate point of view. And for most of us, it takes nine to 10 years to train as a consultant anaesthetist. So in terms of my training, I, it took me from five years medical school and then a further nine years postgrad training. So 14 years of training to become a specialist anaesthetist. Uh, I've been a consultant in anaesthesia since um, 1999 uh, to present day. 
um, and we recently very nicely moved into a brand new building. So we've got a brand new hospital at the Royal Liverpool uh, University Hospital. Um, I've special interest in anaesthesia, which I've continued for a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm the most experienced anaesthetist in the city for colorectal anaesthesia, which is an, uh, surgery basically on bowel and other related organs within the abdomen. And I'm the most experienced anaesthetist in ophthalmic surgery at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. Uh, and we're a national centre for ophthalmic surgery in Liverpool. So the two big centres for ophthalmic surgery are Moorfields in London and St Paul's Hospital in Liverpool. Um, I've also lectured on perioperative medicine and acute pain management. So that's my background to talking to you, you all about uh, anaesthesia. So it's usually appropriate to fit in a uh, quote from Shakespeare. Shakespeare has a quote for everything. And it doesn't matter what it is, you can find a, sh a quote for, from Shakespeare to fit in with the topic that you're talking about. And this is from a more obscure play by William Shakespeare, The Tragedy of Cymbeline. And he mentions that he that sleeps feels not the toothache. Um, perhaps it's not quite so straightforward as that, uh, as we'll soon find out. Um, so human beings right into ancient history have oft always needed to find a way to relieve pain, whether they were attacked by a, a tiger in the, in the forest or fallen over or been involved in a battle. Human beings have always sustained injuries and illnesses and have sought to find ways in which to manage that pain or treat the injury that they come across. So here on the, does anyone know what this is on the right hand side? Can any of the children answer while we're talking or is that possible? Anyone know what this plant is on the right? Yeah, they can put their hands up. If they put their hands up, I'll call their name, they can talk. Maybe just one or two, it'll be okay. We can, we can take it in a nice relaxed way if they want to join in. Does anyone know what that plant is? Hafsa? Hafsa? Hafsa. Is it opium? Correct, Hafsa. It's opium. So this is the opium poppy here. And human beings going far back as the Sumerians, around about three, three and a half thousand years BC, cultivated the opium poppy. And on Sumerian tablets, and some of you may also be aware that a lot of the history of language and alphabet was recorded by the Sumerians on tablets of stone. And they first described uh, uh, a plant which they called Hulgil, which translates as the plant of joy. Um, um, but that term is still used in certain parts of the world. The term gill is still the name for opium in certain parts of the world. Also around about the same time, the Sumerian goddess Nidaba was often depicted with poppies growing out of her shoulders. So it may be that it was a very much more popular um, uh, drug or chemical or herb than we even realize. Also notice right at the top of the the alcohol is was the oldest known sedative used by human in human civilization. Um, so that still probably remains true to, to this very day. And the ancient Egyptians had some surgical instruments that we know of. Some of them were found in tombs. And we also seen depictions of uh, the use of creams and of the topical to not just general anesthetics, but things that uh, applied to to the skin to relieve pain or to be used as an anaesthetic. Um, they used an extract of a, a, a fruit called the mandrake fruit, which seemed to alleviate pain in, in many ways. Also in depictions of Greek gods, the Greek god of sleep, Hypnos, the Greek god of the nighttime, Nyx and Thanatos, even the Greek god of death were often depicted holding poppies. Uh, prior to the introduction of opium, usually from the Far East, like India and China, these civilizations pioneered the use of cannabis incenses and uh, a plant called aconitum, which actually was mostly used as a poison. 
um, but in more dilute forms, they, it was used as an anaesthetic. And interestingly, Hippocrates, who is who is viewed as the almost the founder of modern medicine and the the author of the Hippocratic Oath, he was poisoned uh, later on in his life, and it's thought he was poisoned with aconitum. So that was sort of quite ironic end to Hippocrates that a drug that they used as a medicine killed the original founder of modern medicine. Um, also, there are other religious texts uh, which have found that um, the use of wine mixed with cannabis could be used as an anaesthetic. And also by the 8th century, Arab traders had brought opium wide, widespread across Western Europe. So that's when opium started to become a much more popular drug uh, in the West. But let's not forget about other parts of the world because things were happening in a parallel way. Um, the Chinese were in, the Chinese medicine was in, very, in many ways extremely advanced in terms of anesthesia, and they probably don't get the credit they deserve. A lot of the credit for modern anesthetic is given to Western uh, scientists, but it's certainly true that from a very early early stage, the Chinese physicians were using concoctions which were not so dissimilar to what was happening in Europe and were probably doing it earlier. This uh, chap on the left-hand side of the slide is a, a, a man called Huao To, and he was a Chinese surgeon of the second century and performed surgery under general anesthesia. So we'll come a little bit later as to who was credited with giving the first ever general anesthetic. But Wao To certainly has got a good a good um, argument for it being him. Um, he developed a, a, a sort of concoction mixing wine with a whole range of herbal extracts, and uh, he called this concoction Mayfazan, and they used that. He used that to resect gangrenous bowel from somebody. So you don't do that very easily, as I know. I, I operate a lot of the time with patients needing bowel surgery, and it's not a straightforward uh, uh, operation with modern anaesthetics. So how we managed to do that with his concoction of wine and herbs, I don't really know. Um, it was thought that this uh, concoction was able to give the patient both unconsciousness and neuromuscular blockade. In other words, that means the muscles of the abdomen are paralyzed also. And for him to be able to do that um, around about 2000 years ago is pretty impressive. So let's move over to the Middle Ages now. And then things started to move a little bit faster. Uh, and Again, it was a development of what people sort of knew already. A lot of the time, opium and alcohol and cannabis were still the basis of a lot of what people used to um, achieve anesthesia. Um, this is a picture from the Middle Ages in, in, in England. So this, this woman here is mix, is, has the recipe ready to go with a little pot ready to heat up this concoction. And this lady is ready to collect the concoction and then give it to this poor individual who the bench he's on not only um, does he not look very comfortable, but looks too small. And I'm not sure what operation they're gonna perform on him, but I wouldn't be too keen on the, what's gonna happen later on. But they did use a, th uh, from as early as 1020, there was a, um, a device called the sopor soporific sponge. So if we think about modern anesthesia, this, this sponge was placed under a patient's nose and they were told to breathe in this and apparently made them sleepy. Whether it was sleepy enough to perform major surgery, I think there's some doubt about that. But there are a number of, re of uh, records of a potion called Dwell particularly in England, and yet again, of course he does, Shakespeare mentions Dwayne in Hamlet, and it's also mentioned in a John Keats poem, Ode to a Nightingale. 
Uh, and there is a recorded recipe for dwale, although um, how much of it is active and how much of it is uh, just part of the mixture, I don't really know. So I don't know what the children think about taking a concoction containing bile, opium, lettuce, bryony, hembane, hemlock, which is a poison, and vinegar. Um, that would maybe be enough for me to run out of an operating theatre rather than carry on and have an operation. And then at the end of the operation, after being rendered senseless by Dwale, they then rouse them by rubbing more vinegar and salt into their cheekbones. Um, interestingly, when I first started anesthesia, we don't do this anymore. But the people who taught me 30 years ago uh, said that we had to rouse patients out by either pulling on their ears or rubbing their nose or rubbing on their chest. But we don't do that anymore. <laughs> You'd be pleased to hear. Also, round about the, in the certainly the late Middle Ages and certainly getting on to the 15th, 16th century, people were starting to understand chemistry a little bit better. And they were understanding the properties of different chemical compounds and mixing things. It was also around at the time of alchemists who were desperately trying to mix this different chemicals together to um, make gold. That was the that was their ultimate goal was to m make gold out of cheaper products. And I don't think any of them um, succeeded in that. But an alchemist called Ramon Lyul has been credited with discovering ether, which is an anesthetic agent, in 1275. But I don't think he really knew how he did it and really why that happened. So, but later on, Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, which I think is the best name in the whole lecture, better known as Paracelsus, which is a little bit easier to get your mouth around, isn't it? He discovered the analgesic properties of ether around about 1525 but the first person who properly uh, did the recipe um, and how to make it was someone called Valerius Cordus so this picture on the top shows you I'm not suggesting any of the children try this at the weekend in the garden shed or in their kitchen but ether is pretty easy to make really um, you get just get some alcohol and you add concentrated uh, sulfuric acid to it, boil it up, and then the alcohol boils up off at the top. And if you've got a condensing thing here, then the ether will condense down as long as it's cooled in ice water. So it's a pretty easy chemical to make. Um, and what I want the children to also look at, so ether was probably the first, what we might call modern anesthetic. Um, the important thing is this bond here, so look at this, this what's called a diethyl bond. It's a, any of those of you who are interested in chemistry, this is an extremely important bond in um, anesthetics in general. Uh, so all, most of the, although this was the first one to have this bond with oxygen in the middle and a double bond to these carbon uh, atoms, most of the modern anesthetics we use today still have this bond there, although there's lots of other bits attached to the molecule. But all modern gaseous anesthetics still have this bond. So that stayed throughout history as a powerful. So that's obviously very important in how they work. Um, uh, the mixture of ether that, that was made in this way was called oleum dulce vitrole, which is a name that reflects that it was mixed with. Uh, ethanol and sulfuric acid, but I have used ether once a very long time ago. You won't really see it used anymore, but it is quite an oily liquid which which boils very easily and becomes gaseous very easily. So those scientists back in the day were describing it in a very accurate way. It was very oily. Now, this is when it starts getting really interesting, and this is where um, we start getting close to the discovery of more of the modern anesthetic agents, and that's in the 18th century. So Joseph Priestley and others wrote lots of papers uh, in the early 1700s, moving into the early 19th century, and they discovered nitrous oxide, which is still an anesthetic gas, nitric oxide, 
which is still used in intensive care units all around the world and was widely used for the treatment of COVID during the COVID pandemic. Um, ammonia, hydrogen chloride, which are both used often for sterilization and other things. And then oxygen, they discovered oxygen and how to manufacture it in, in large quantities. Uh, they got together with lots of other uh, scientists who were interested in the sort of properties of gases in particular and um, founded the Pneumatic Institution for Inhalational Gas Therapy in Bristol. Uh, and they also then employed other people who were physicists like Humphrey Davy of the, of, the, of the Safety Davy Lamp and James Watt of the Watt, as in the, the measurement of the scientific measurement of power. Um, and they noticed that nitrous oxide seem to be able to eliminate physical pain. Um, possibly it could be used for advantage to eliminate the pain of surgery. Nitrous oxide is also the gas that's mixed with oxygen in women who are in labor having babies, otherwise known as gas and air. So nitrous oxide is the other gas with gas and air. So it's oxygen, nitrous oxide mixture. So again, we're still using nitrous oxide in 2023 all over the world with great uh, with great success. And this is a close up of this cartoon because a lot of fun was being made of these scientists who were um, uh, experimenting with gases. This is Humphrey Davy here of the Davy lamp with his bellows. Um, and this is, uh, I think, Beddoes administering some gaseous concoction to the poor. Uh, um, guinea pig and also some other gas seems to be emanating from a separate area which the audience don't seem to be too keen on <laughs> but interesting I think the most so this is some journalists rapidly writing down this great new discovery that you could give gases to someone and the gases would render you unconscious but the person who is most interesting to me is this gentleman here I, my, I suspect this gentleman here is a businessman who he looks very calm and relaxed about it, but he's got his monocle out looking closely at one. I think he sees a way of making lots of money out, about, out of these gases here. That's just my assumption. I've no idea of knowing. It's quite a funny picture, though. Now, so a little bit like the race to the moon or a little bit like who ran the first four minute mile. There was a lot of debate about who actually gave the first modern anaesthetic. Well, as, as they often like to, the Americans wanted to be first. And it, it's probably true that they did reach the goal of giving the first modern anaesthetic first. But who it exactly was is still up for some debate. Um, so... Three out of four of these men are dentists, so they're not doctors at all. So Quincy Colton is a dentist, Horace Wells is a dentist, and William T.G. Morgan is a dentist. But Crawford Long was a physician. But they were all fr sort of friendly or rather knew each other all around about the same time in the 1840s, over in, mainly in Boston, Massachusetts in America. And... Um, they all knew of what had been happening in London with the Pneumatic Society and the use of nitrous oxide. But actually what the development of the first general anaesthetic came from was possibly the misuse of these drugs. Because in these sort of circles, middle class, richer circles, people could hire machines that gave you nitrous oxide. And they used it for recreational use, not for <laughs> medicinal use. Um, and Wells and Morton knew each other at university. And they used to go to parties where they would misuse nitrous oxide rather than use it for its, the, the, the use that it was intended for. Um, but the official view is that the first, the first um, general anaesthetic um, was given by Morton, which is this chap here. And he's a dentist. 
And he used just nitrous oxide and oxygen and took someone's tooth. So it's the, so the first operation under general anesthetic that is recorded um, was by Morton in 1842. And it was a dental extraction. But then other people heard about this um, and tried to do other operations uh, with it, some unsuccessfully. And some patients died in, in the early stages of learning how to do this. Um, so they modified the technique and used ether. Uh, so this is a reconstruction of the first truly the first operation that was ever done with a general anaesthetic. And this was done by Morton. The anaesthetic was administered by Morton. And um, this is him here. This patient is a guy called Edward Gilbert Abbott, and he had a lump on his neck. Um, so they did this in public at Massachusetts General Hospital on the 16th of October, 1846. This photograph is not the original photograph. It was done a, a few weeks later as a reconstruction of what they'd done. Um, so the, the official record states that the first general anesthetic in a hospital was given in Massachusetts General Hospital in 1846. Um, and if you go there, you can, if any of you have ever visited the, um, Boston, you can go to Massachusetts General Hospital and this structure is still there and it's still called the Ether Dome to celebrate the fact that they gave the first ever general anaesthetic in the world. The truth is they probably didn't give the first ever general anaesthetic in the world, but they've got the credit for it. So good, good on them. As I'm a UK anaesthetist, I can't talk about anaesthesia without mentioning this chap. This is John Snow. He was a physician in Victorian England. Um, he had two major, major um, successes. He's a pioneer of UK anaesthesia. And he pioneered the safe use of chloroform, which again was a new anesthetic drug and ether. And he popularized chloroform because he gave chloroform to Queen Victoria. This is a mock a cartoon of Queen Victoria being given chloroform via a silk han handkerchief while she was in labor having their children, the ch uh, later children of Prince Leopold and Princess Beatrice, 1857. And no one wanted to use chloroform because it was much more dangerous gas than ether. And quite a lot of people died under chloroform anesthesia. Um, but the Queen really liked it for pain relief during her pregnancies. Uh, so it became popular because the Queen liked it. And then lots more people had chloroform. The other thing that Jon Snow was famous for was discovering the outbreak of uh, a cholera out outbreak in the east end of London and they thought the, the cholera was transmitted in the air and it was Jon Snow who realized uh, it was not transmitted in the air at all it was water bound and he was the first uh, modern epidemiologist in other words someone who studied the the cause and prevention of disease rather than necessarily cure and he, tr he did a special um, map of the area and mapped back all the victims of cholera to a single water pump in the east end of London. And that was, no one had ever done anything like that. So he's truly a great in UK medicine, not just for his work on anesthesia, but for his work in epidemiology. Um, of course, not all anaesthetics are general anaesthetics. Lots of anaesthetics are what we call local anaesthetics. And in modern anaesthesia, local anaesthesia or regional anaesthesia is much more common than it used to be. And this chap on the right is Sigmund Freud. So Sigmund Freud obviously is very famous for his work on psychoanalysis, psychology, and so on. Um, but he was also very interested in a drug called cocaine. And he's interested in a drug called cocaine for lots of reasons. Um, one, for recreation. He used cocaine regularly from a recreational point of view. But he also used cocaine for some of his uh, psychiatric patients as a treatment. Um, so round about that time in Central Europe, in, in and around Vienna, 
there were large numbers of physicians, psychologists, psychiatrists who were studying the effects of cocaine and for a whole range of reasons. Um, <clears throat> and he had a friend called Carl Collar. That's this guy on the left. Um, and interestingly, the way they wrote it in the literature, uh, when they'd been tasting cocaine, um, they realized that it would numb their, numb their tongue and their mouth. And they felt that the, was there a possible way of using this for medicinal purposes? So <clears throat> they published a paper at a conference in 1885 where they described the use of cocaine just dropped onto the eye. Uh, and their first eye surgery under local anaesthetic was done by collar under cocaine anaesthetic. Again, going back to what we said about ether, whereas all modern anaesthetics, are, the, if you look at the molecular structure, are very closely related to um, ether, all modern local anaesthetics are all structurally very closely related to cocaine although they're made in a synthetic way now. Um, later on in the early 20th century, the use of local anesthetics in more complex procedures like epidurals or spinals was developed over time. <laughs> but the principle of using a cocaine-based a, a cocaine -based drug uh, was established by um, an eye surgeon, not uh, an anesthetist at all. So. Things don't ever happen overnight. They, as we see from the history of anesthesia, the development happens over time in a gradual way. And people learn from the previous generation about what works and what doesn't work. <clears throat> well, really, we have to say that the 20th century was the most rapidly developing uh, period of history in the history of anesthesia, and probably more the late 20th century. So. After the Second World War, most of the big <clears throat> developments in anesthesia uh, came about. So it was a century with rapid change, and the big developments were the use of airways to actually tubes and different pipes to put in the breathing system to control the airway, the increasing use of intravenous anesthetic agents rather than gases, and the first intravenous one that was in common use was thiopentone and that was developed in 1934 and it's a drug we still use today although not as often as we used to we certainly use it a reasonable amount there's an apocryphal story that in the in the uh, aftermath of the pearl harbor attack in the second world war there were many injured soldiers and sailors in pearl harbor and they had this, the anaesthetists there had this new drug called thiopentone, um, but it was quite new and they didn't really know how to use it. And the apocryphal story is that there were more soldiers killed by the misuse of thiopentone than were killed by the injuries. Um, it, it could be an urban myth, but there's certainly some truth in that. They didn't understand how it worked uh, and it can be quite a lethal drug if you give the wrong dose. Mechanical ventilators were developed in the, in the backdrop to the polio epidemic in the 1950s. There was a big polio epidemic across Scandinavia. Um, um, patients had to be ventilated by medical students just manually, just hand ventilating them. So people decided that there'd be a good way of using um, a machine to ventilate you. And that's when most mechanical ventilators were developed at, in the aftermath of the polio epidemic. Neuromuscular blocking drugs are drugs that block muscle activity so that you're paralyzed during an operation so that the muscles are relaxed. Most of the work, I'm very proud to say on that, was done in the University of Liverpool by a guy called Professor Cecil Gray, and he understood that the use of a drug called Curare could be used as an anesthetic agent. And then some new gases were developed in the early, late 50s, early 60s, of halothane and emphorane. So what this all meant was anesthesia had gone from being quite a rudimentary specialty where you could basically do fairly simple operations without pain, but it was hard to control the physiology and it was hard to uh, do anything lengthy. And we then moved 
in the sort of late 50s, early 60s to be able to do complex, long, dangerous procedures, but very safely. Um, and then also round about that time, anesthesia was reckon, re recognized as a specialty in its own right and had subspecialties such as of intensive care medicine and pain medicine. So here's some examples of just the sort of drugs that were used and what we have now. So this on the left is an old, very old box of thiopentone. Like I say, this was the first intravenous anesthetic, but we still have this drug now and you'll, I could have taken a photograph from my sh the shelf earlier on today. We still have thiopentone, but this by far is the number one intravenous anesthetic. This is the one you will see if you have a, if you needed to have an anesthetic next week, you would almost certainly be given propofol to send you off to sleep. It's extremely safe, extremely long history of use. Uh, it's been a, a major advance in modern anesthesia probably over the last 20 years. <clears throat> so here's a brief summary of the history of some of these anesthetics. So. The ones that you will see most commonly now are propofol, which was developed in the late 70s, uh, but commonly used from the late uh, mid 80s onwards. Ketamine is an old drug from the uh, 60s, but now is used commonly in modern anesthesia. Lorazepam and midazolam are two sedative agents that are used a lot. Lorazepam is also used in the treatment of epilepsy. And then these older, what we call barbiturates, you won't really see at all now. None of these three are used anymore, but thiopentone is still used and still used regularly, particularly in the developing world because it's cheaper than propofol. So in resource poor countries, uh, they'll use thiopentone a lot more than maybe propofol because it's, it's very cheap. Uh, it's also an extremely safe drug, but um, like I mentioned about the Pearl Harbor disaster, in the wrong hands, it's a very dangerous drug, but that's true of all anaesthetics. Um, how we administer the what we call volatile agents or gaseous agents has um, developed dramatically over time, but the principle remains the same. So this is a really old ether vaporizer, probably from the 1920s. Um, so what you do is you pour the ether liquid in that chamber and then you've got a, the gas comes in, goes into the chamber, vaporizes the ether, and comes out the other end, and then you mix it with oxygen. But that's what we call a, a non-calibrated vaporizer. So you're just hoping for the best as to what concentration of ether you've got there. Um, and you can get it wrong quite easily. But as these are modern vaporizers, these are the sort of vaporizers I use every single day of my career. So this is the most commonly used vapor now, sevoflurane, by far the number one anesthetic agent in the world. And, and these numbers across the top are the concentration that we set. So we just turn that dial and we can get the concentration. So these are what we call compensated vaporizers. So they allow for the vapor cool, different temperatures, the vapor cooling down, different flow rates through the so what it's set up there is extremely accurate, but we also have gas monitors on our machine so that there's no discrepancy between what we set and what the patient receives. Um, this is what I wanted to show you from earlier on. So this is ether. So this is the ether, the diethyl ether link. So this is the most important part of all these molecules. So if you look at the common molecules that we use, there's SIBO. Like I say, millions and millions of anesthetics are given every year with sevoflurane. Desflurane, not so much. Isoflurane is extremely common. Enflurane, not so much now. That's I used that when I first started, but we don't really use that anymore. All of these drugs that are the modern anesthetics all have that bond in them. So this is an important part of how it penetrates nerve tissue and brain tissue. Um, uh, but, but the answer is no one knows how our general anesthetics work. <laughs> so that's, that's often a question patients ask me and I say, I, I don't know how it works, but I know how to keep you safe. Um, 
This is nitrous oxide, which is still in common use, but it's an extremely simple molecule and doesn't have this bond. Um, we don't really know how nitrous oxide works, but we do think it probably works through the same pathway as opioids. So let's remember going back all the way through to three and a half thousand BC, people were given opioids as a part of an anesthetic. And in 2023, we're still using a drug that works through the same pathway. Um, these photographs are just to show you some uh, how our equipment has changed over the years. So this is what's called a Macintosh blade. Um, I'm going to ask a question now of the children to see if anyone can work out what they think that is for. If anyone can work out what they think that blade, it looks quite gruesome, doesn't it? Anyone, any ideas what that is for? Any hands up, anyone? Win win. Uh, thank you for having me. So I think Hello. maybe it's like um a heart mature, like where you like hear the heart. That like that um like it, Mr. Golden. Okay, well it's a it's a good it's a good guess. Um it's it's not it's that's not what it's for though, but we do use lots of devices that measure the heartbeat. And I'll maybe show you, I think, on the next slide or two. No, if, if I'll describe it to everyone watching, so this is the handle. So you so if you're right-handed, okay, you hold this handle in your left hand. And this is what we call the Macintosh blade, okay? So look at the curve on it. It's a similar curve to the shape of your tongue, isn't it? Can you see that? And that blade goes inside the mouth and moves the tongue out of the way so that we can see the breathing tube on the inside, or see the vocal cords rather. So we lift the tongue out of the way with this handle to move everything out of the way. This is while the patient's asleep, don't worry, we wouldn't do it on someone who's awake. <laughs> um, and when, that's the first design of it from the sort of 1940s. But we still use that blade now, but in a metal disposable form, but it's almost exactly the same shape. Okay, so that's called a Macintosh blade. You'll see that a lot. It's called a laryngoscope. It's a way of looking at the larynx. And this on the left is the most modern version of it. OK, so with the one on the right, you lift it out the way and you just look with your eyes. But sometimes it's hard to see around the corner. If that makes sense. And some people are different shapes and sizes. And some people are, have, have what's called a difficult intubation or a difficult airway. And you can't see what's happening. So this thing is called a McGrath blade. So there's the patient down here. That's the anesthetist's hand in the left hand with the handle. And that's a little video screen. Can, you see, can everyone see that? So instead of looking around the corner with a light, the video, there's a camera on the tip of, on this bit here, on a modern version. So there's a little camera here. And you get a view around the corner when you can't see. And that's called a video laryngoscope. Uh, and we've moved now in our hospital where most anesthetics, are, uh, uh, most tubes are inserted with a video laryngoscope now. So that's been a big move forward in modern anesthesia. Um, now, anyone, any idea why I've put this picture on the bottom here of uh, a man with a blowpipe? Anyone got any ideas? Is it to put people to sleep? So do you think you could shoot people with a blowpipe and put them to sleep? Well, you might kill them with it, but unfortunately they won't be asleep because what this man is doing, he is blowing, he uses it as a hunting weapon and on the tip of his arrow through his blowpipe is a chemical called curare. And curare paralyzes you. So he would shoot it at monkeys or birds in the tree that are a long way away and would paralyze the monkey and it would fall to the ground. And it, but the, the monkey would still be uh, awake until they stop breathing, of course. So this, was, this idea was developed by anesthetists in Liverpool, where I work, 
as a way of paralyzing patients, but when they're already asleep so that you could access different body cavities more easily. So this is the first muscle relaxant, tubo curare. This stuff here on the left is what I use every day. It's a drug called rocuronium. And this is the most modern muscle relaxant. But notice in its name, it's still got C-U-R. And all muscle relaxants have still, as a memory of the first muscle relaxant curare, they've all got C-U-R in their name. And these things here are no longer a blowpipe, but these are cannula that go into your veins and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, so although not the same, the principles of a lot of what they, we do hasn't changed. So there's a picture of curare. This is curare, the plant is found in the Amazon rainforest. It's proper name, Chondrodendron tomentosum. And this is a, its molecular structure. But here are all the modern muscle relaxants that we all use now. And yet again, we find that the same structure goes across the generations and across the centuries. And all of these drugs, they've all got CUR in their name, as you can see, atricurium, rocuronium, becuronium, pancuronium. These are all muscle relaxants, and this is the original one, curare. This is a slightly different subgroup of the muscle relax. This is a drug called succinylcholine. And you may or may, I don't know how far on you are in your science studies, but this is a very common neurotransmittable acetylcholine. And succinylcholine, which is a muscle relaxant, is two molecules of this, two molecules of this joined together, like mirror images of each other. I don't know if you can all see that. And this is how muscle relaxants work. So this is the nerve that supplies your muscles. And you get a nerve impulse going along. And then when the nerve impulse hits the muscle, you get acetylcholine release. That's all these little red balls on the picture. And then these are the receptors on your muscle. And when the acetylcholine hits the receptor, you get an, you get an electrical stimulus and then the muscle contracts. What the muscle relaxants we use in, in um, anesthesia do is they block that hole there. They sit in there so the acetylcholine can't have its normal effect and then you're paralyzed. Moving on to the painkillers, well, there's an old bottle of morphine sulfate, which again, morphine has been around with us for a very long time, either in the form of opium or a pure form of morphine. Very important, poison, it's poisonous. Too much morphine is not good for you. And then this stuff here is remifentanil, and that's the most modern opioid that we've got. We use it as a continuous infusion, which means we give it for as, as long as we need, but when we switch it off, it wears off in about five minutes. So that is a major advantage over morphine, which can hang around for a long time and make you very drowsy and make you feel sick. And these are now all the, all the different opiates that are available to us in modern medicine. So if we go back to 3,400, we had opium and that was it. And then people worked out to get morphine out, codeine, propavarine, thebane. So they're all from plants. So they're derived from plants. Then the rest of them, diamorphine, otherwise known as heroin, um, they're all made in factories with using some of these naturally occurring products. And then all of the modern opiates that we use regularly anesthesia, they're all made in factories. Um, pethidine, commonly used painkiller in, um, again, women, the pain of having babies, and that was developed in the Second World War. For well, opiates, I think it is important for me to just briefly mention opiates because they're commonly used drugs and remember they've been used across human history for basically as far back as we can go <laughs> and still today human beings have a real problem with opiates uh, many people are addicted to them and many people uh, will fight and kill over them there's a lot of crime associated with opiates and the opiate trade but as doctors, we need to be aware that they're also prescribed drugs 
and we uh, in many ways we've got it wrong so the big story particularly out of the states this is from 2019 over 70,000 people in the United States of America died from opiate overdose that's prescribed opiates that's not illegal drugs think about that think you know think about the deaths from covid and so on this is happening every year from opiates 1.6 million people had opiate use disorder in the, in that year as well uh, so for some reason that is hard to explain human beings and their bodies like opiates a lot and they're extremely dangerous drugs in the wrong hands you may or may not recognize these celebrities uh, some of them more famous than others i think most people will recognize michael jackson wouldn't they and certainly maybe prince uh, this is an actor called heath ledger and another actor called philip seymour hoffman all four of these uh, poor souls died from opiate overdose or opiates made mainly contributing to their death Michael Jackson died from a combination of propofol, which was that white anesthetic drug I showed you earlier on, and a drug called oxycodone, which is a, another synthetic opiate. Uh, um, Prince died from a fentanyl overdose. Heath Ledger and C, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman both died from fentanyl overdoses. So um, many people are not immune from the dangers of opiate use. So we're coming towards the end now. I'm just going to show you some differences between old stuff and modern stuff. So this is the very first anesthetic machine. It was very rudimentary around about the early 1900s. Basically, it had cylinders of oxygen and uh, cylinders of oxygen and um, nitrous oxide. This thing there was that old ether vaporizer, and they basically hoped for the best in how much you got. There was a little valve affecting the mixture, but didn't wasn't really accurate um, and they were still learning on the job but it was still like in a trolley design we'll move on to the one on the right so this is the type of anesthetic machine that i first ever learned on in 1992 so obviously a long time ago <laughs> um, the way that anesthetic machine works is not so different from this other than it's much more accurate uh, so these things here are flow meters you can alter how much oxygen nitrous oxide goes in it's it's not on the picture but the vaporizer sits in this position and have, and those these machines were very reliable very accurate and you will still see these around in certain places maybe again in resource poor countries they're very very good accurate machines but this is the sort of machine i use every single day very similar to the one I use, not identical, but very, very similar. So most of it is touch screen. So this is all a touch screen. This is a touch screen. There were no what we call flow meters involved. We set everything via a computer at the bottom. This is the ventilator bag to ventilate the patient if the ventilator fails. But most of the time, the patient is ventilated by a machine. All of the vital signs of the patient are monitored through these screens. So we have come an extremely long way through this journey, through the history of anesthesia. Thankfully, none of us will have to go back to the days where they would hold you down, give you large amounts of alcohol while they try to perform a general anesthetic. Um, this is the normal scenario now for a general anesthetic. It's extremely safe procedure now. It's a very calm, relaxed environment with high-tech equipment monitoring every single detail of how your body works, your heart rate, your blood pressure, the oxygen level, so on. There's the patient there. They've got a breathing tube in them. They're attached to a ventilator. Um, and then the surgery can carry on for as long or as complex procedure as is necessary. So this is just a timeline. I won't talk about every single detail on it. If we go back to 1846, first recorded general anaesthetic, basically anaesthetists through, through, through those couple of hundred years have worked our way through, so much so that we're using 
videolaryngoscopes, intravenous anesthesia, complex monitoring, and so on. So what, what does the future hold? Well, like in most aspects of life, artif artificial intelligence and robotic technology are coming into anesthesia. This is an anesthetic robot. So hopefully I'm not too far off um, retirement before uh, I'm replaced by a robot. This robot is intubating the patient. So this is the, but again, look, the curve on the blade, exactly the same as that old Macintosh blade from the 1940s. So some stuff that always did work, always will work, even though a robot is the hand instead of a human being. This patient here is giving herself her own anesthetic. <laughs> Um, or rather sedation. So she's having a procedure done under x-ray control, and this is her own self-administering anaesthetist. So she's attached by a drip, and she's got a button in her hand, and as it hur if it hurts a bit too much, she presses the button more, and she gets more anaesthetic out of the machine. Um, let's, should we just say that the development of that is at its early stages, and I don't think we're quite at the technology yet? But I'm sure in the next 20 or 30 years, these sort of devices will become much more commonly used. These two pumps here are pumps that I use almost every day. So this is what's called TIVA, T-I-V-A, total intravenous anesthesia. Whereas rather than using gases to put people to sleep, we just use intravenous drugs that are controlled by computerized pumps. Now you still need to give oxygen, obviously, and you still need to usually use a ventilator. But all of the things that keep you asleep and keep you paralyzed are all given intravenously. So I'm going to, my final slide is a, the crest of the Royal College of Anesthetists. So this is an organization I'm extremely proud to be a member of, uh, extremely proud to be an examiner for. It's a modern forward-looking specialty uh, that maintains standards at a very high level but still never forgets its past. So these two people either side of the crest of arms of the Royal College of Nieces. This is John Snow, who we talked about earlier on. This is a, the guy who is probably the founding father of UK anesthesia. So he's remembered on our coat of arms. This other guy is a guy called John, uh, sorry, Joseph Clover, who when John Snow died, he took over the mantle of developing anaesthesia in, the, in England and the UK. On our coat of arms, the Rose of England, opium poppies and cocaine leaves. And then also the, the serpent represents surgery. So our close relationship between anaesthesia and surgery. So all of the things that we used four or 5,000 years ago, we still use today or some derivative of them. Anesthesia uh, is essential to good medicine, essential to safe surgery, and it is divine to alleviate pain. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Wow, I'm, I'm clapping. Um, the children are sort of bringing their hands up as well. Just totally amazing. I've learned so much. Fantastic talk, sir. Thank you so Thank much. You no, really fantastic. The hands are already going up for questions. Do you have, I know we started a wee bit late, but if you've got, I've got a few minutes. I've got plenty of time, as long, oh, as, you lovely. Like, as long as you like. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's start with Martina. Hi, um, I just wanted can I see, to. Oh, I can see your face now. I can see Hi. It. Um, hi, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this talk. It was honestly super entertaining and so informative. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, since I'm inspired to study medicine, yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, how were your medical uh, years like and what would you recommend to those who aspire to become doctors? Um, do you mean how were my years at university or, or across the whole of my career? Do you mean, a, do you mean as a student? So, so I wanted to be a doctor from a very, very early age, possibly even younger than, can I ask how, how old you are? I'm 15. 15. So, 
So I wanted to be a, a, a doctor from about the age of 11. I don't really know what it was. Obs I was obsessive about it, completely obsessive uh, and didn't want to do anything else. Um, so from an early age, I started writing to the British Medical Association. I wrote to universities. Maybe a bit weird, isn't it? Maybe that's a little bit strange behavior. But anyway, there we are. So I got multiple replies. They were very kind to me and they sent me lots of replies back. Um, so I knew precisely what I wanted to do. Uh, I, wa I wasn't going to be deviated in that path. I was going to apply to... Well, in those days, you could apply to five different universities uh, and then hopefully be accepted by one or two. Um, so I made it to Newcastle University, which is in the top five medical schools in the UK, but is also in the top 10 medical schools in the world. So I was extremely lucky to get a place there. And my time as a student was just like, for me, out of this world you know I just felt so lucky to be there I made lots of friends there the people who had similar interests obviously because you know we all wanted to be doctors but also what I was also privileged to go to such an institution where there were really world-renowned professors there who taught me well what they taught me, I think the most important thing that they taught me, although there was knowledge involved and science and just lots of, you know, book work, what they taught me is what a privilege it is to be a doctor and how people put their trust in you often unconditionally or they don't know what's wrong with them or they don't understand science or for a whole, you meet everyone in Everyone in life you meet as a doctor, you know, everyone usually gets sick at some point in their life. So what my teachers at university taught me was how to respect everyone you meet as a patient and how to um, convey humanity through medicine as well, not just science. Because it's not just a scientific subject being a doctor. You need a lot of science. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. You need to have a scientific background. But if you are a pure scientist, then maybe pure medicine isn't for you because you need the humanity side to it as well to help you through the difficulties you'll face as a doctor. And then in my postgraduate training, um, I came across anaesthetics by accident, really, is that's the honest truth. What I wanted to be was a cardiologist. I'd always wanted to do that right through medical school. I was obsessed by the heart and the circulation and how that all works. One of my heroes at medical school was the consultant cardiologist who taught me. I was just in awe of him. And all I wanted to be was like him with a white coat on and a big stethoscope and be as good as him and know everything that he knew. That was when I was 20. I'm not like that now. And uh, um, so that was the plan. And so in the early jobs that I, I, I didn't get the job that I wanted to get onto cardiology training, I didn't get that job. So I didn't know what to do. So I did accidents and emergency instead. So emergency medicine was my first proper job as a doctor. And when I did that, I was constantly meeting anaesthetists who were there uh, because you may or may not know, nearly all intensive care doctors are anaesthetists as well. Nearly all of them, not all of them. It depends on the country, but in the UK, most intensive care doctors are anaesthetists. So, I would meet these people who knew how to deal with really sick patients and knew how to control the heart and breathing and so on. And one of them said to me, you know, you'd be a really good anaesthetist. And I thought, well, I, I don't even know what I'd be good at, you know. And they said, no, no, you should try it. You should give it a try. So I took a job as a brand new anaesthetist, not knowing anything, not knowing how to do it. And within... Um, six weeks, just fell in love with the specialty straight away, like really loved it. 
and was quite good at it really quickly. I don't mean to be immodest, but I was pretty good at it straight away, which was a surprise. And I was also, yet again, taught by people who were giants in the field. So one of my mentors at the time, and you can look her up on Google if you want, was a woman called Professor Jenny Hunter. So if you Google her, she's now Emeritus Professor at the University of Liverpool, but she is a world-renowned expert on muscle relaxants, you know, we were talking earlier in the talk. And she took me under her wing and then that was it. Well, I was hooked then. So I gave up on being a cardiologist, but I look after people's hearts every single day. So I still sort of do sort of cardiology. Um, so I'm happy with the way it turned out. But everyone's different in what, you know, you, going into medical school, you, you just don't know what type of doctor you're going to be. And it takes a while to work that out. Amazing. Any, Thank um, you. Yeah, we've got Jude, who's also yeah. um, hoping to study medicine okay. this year, actually. Hello, Jude. Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. So I had two questions to ask. When did you sort of choose your medical speciality? That's my first question. And my second question, is there sort of a criteria to know whether a patient is feasible to be under anesthesia? Ah, uh, no, the second question. So the first question's easy. So like I say, I, I decided to do anesthetics um, when I was doing emergency medicine. That was when, so that was, that was fairly straightforward. Because the anaesthetists knew what they were doing. <laughs> Most of us, when we were brand new doctors, we were a bit nervous and uh, unsure. And then the anaesthetists would turn up like the cavalry, you know, they'd turn up like to rescue everyone. And then we go, oh, thankfully the anaesthetists here, I can relax now. So I thought, well, I want to be like that. You know, I want to be able to turn up and be the cavalry, be the hero. Although we don't get, we don't, we're not the heroes. No one really knows what anaesthetists are. Most of us, most people don't think we're real doctors anyway, but we are. <laughs> um, your second question, how do you decide if someone's fit enough for an anaesthetic? Wow. Um, that is a constant battle and a constant, um, uh, difficult question because we sometimes come across say people with serious illnesses like cancer who need a cancer surgery and they're really not well you know for other reasons they've got a bad breathing their heart is bad they're frail they're elderly maybe 85 86 so what we have are pre-operative assessment clinics uh, where we look at every aspect of their medical conditions, we try and improve what we can improve, and then we plan our anaesthetic around the, the illnesses. So now we do many, many more patients that we wouldn't have done even 10, 20 years ago. So it's rare, it's rare now for us to not proceed with an anaesthetic. It's very rare. And that's been the probably the biggest development in anaesthesia in my career, is that we're, we're proper what we call perioperative physicians now. We, we look at all, it's not, I know I've shown you pictures of different drugs and so on, but really what the truth of anaesthesia is, is managing people who are unwell through their operation and dealing with all their other medical problems rather than just giving them this gas or whatever, this drug. But it's a great question, Jude, great question. Anyone else? Harrison? Yeah. yeah. Harrison, do you want to? Yeah, I know. I just wanted to say, wow, that was a lengthy, very interesting. It but... wasn't too long, was it, Harrison? It wasn't too long. You say lengthy. Was it too long or was it okay? No, it was. <laughs> there's nothing too long. I just wanted to say, is there yeah. any moment in your life in anesthesia, whatever it's called, yeah. where you just felt like you couldn't go on? You just like yes. about yes. to lose hope. Yes, that's a very again amazing question. And I'll, I'll, since you've asked me it, I'm going to be completely honest with you because I think it's only fair. So. 
when I was 20, when I was 30, before I was a consultant, so I was what's called a registrar in anesthesia. Um, I was put in a woman to sleep for a cesarean section, okay? And, um, and it had to be done really quickly because the uh, baby was not well as well. So we had to do it super fast. And when we put people off to sleep, we have to put a tube in the breathing in here in the trachea to keep them safe. But as I mentioned with that picture of the laryngoscope earlier, you have to use a laryngoscope to, to put the tube in. And I looked to see and I couldn't see where to put it. I couldn't see a thing. I couldn't see anything. It was just all red and there was no hole to put it in. And it was scary. So that's what's called a failed intubation. And it doesn't happen very often. And it's only happened to me once in 30 odd years. So what you have to do is either find another way of getting oxygen into the patient or you have to wake the patient up quickly and try something else to get the baby out. But in that moment, that poor woman was starting to not have enough oxygen and it was all very dangerous for her. And I thought she was going to die. And I thought, if she dies, I won't be able to do this job anymore because she would have died and her baby would have died. Do you understand what I'm saying, Harrison? So. Oh, yeah, I understand that. So, so, so time slows down when you're in those sort of moments in life. Sometimes everything goes in slow motion. So not only was I trying to work out what to do, to save the woman's life. But I was also thinking, as this other part of my brain was saying, well, you'll have to give this up then because you can't, this, you can't carry on if she dies. Anyway, there's a happy ending to this story. <laughs> so thank God. So she, um, we did what we call, so we, we woke her up instead because we couldn't get the breathing tube in. So we woke her up and then we could get oxygen back in and she started breathing for herself. And then instead we put what we call a spinal anesthetic into her back. So it's just an injection in her back rather than going off to sleep. And she had her baby and the she, baby was fine and she was fine. So it all worked out good in the end. But that is a good question. So yes, that, that moment in time for those five minutes, I thought that I wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Yeah. And those moments can come at any time. So we all, that's why we're so obsessive about safety and anesthesia. Because everything we do is built around safety. And unless we get the safety right, nothing else matters. Got it. And I love yeah. a happy ending. Yeah. Any other questions, Marty? Oh, no, uh, win, 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 is it? Yes, thank you, Mr. Golden. So um, when I grow up, my uh, my dream job is to be a doctor and yeah. um, to be exact, a neurosurgeon doctor that oh, um, experts in brain, spinal yeah. cord and nervous system. Okay. So I just want to ask you that since you are already a doctor, do you have any advice or tips you can give me? Well, a little bit going back to what I said before. Um, Obviously, particularly for neurosurgery, the pathway to being a, a fully qualified neurosurgeon is very long. So the training is very hard. So you have to be ready for that dedication to that sort of path. That's the first thing. Secondly, you have to really enjoy it. It's not enough for it to just be. Sounds like a good thing now. But when you're 10, 15 years older and that you're doing that job, you have to enjoy it because there's so many difficulties that come with it that you have to have the side of it that's enjoyable. So you have to be fascinated, enthusiastic about it. Uh, that's important. Um, but also, I would say win-win, and it's not you know, any sort of, I don't want to put you off your dreams. You should follow your dreams and all of that. 
But it may be when you've been through medical school, there's something else that you find more interesting than neurosciences. It's possible. Do you see what I mean? So keep, yes. all, keep all your options open. Be broad minded. But number one, be a good doctor. That's all that matters, whether it's a new brain surgeon, heart doctor, Jeep general practitioner. Be a good doctor first and then follow whatever your dream, your interest is second. But it's a long path to be a brain surgeon, I'll tell you that. But, you know, okay. if you want to do it, you'll make it, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Golden. And no thank problem. you for the talk. No worries. I'm happy to carry on, Maria, if anyone. Yeah. Yeah, we've got um, Jude time. and Martina both have questions. It's really fantastic because they're both very serious about their vocation. So, okay. Jude, Jude, what did you want to ask? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of questions going on in my head, but I no did worries. want to ask. Um, when administering the anesthesia, do, yes. would you say that the pre-op and post-op are they standardized for the um, surgeries, or would you say it would differ between types of um, operations? Yeah. So there's two uh, there's two answers to that question. Firstly, firstly, they're not even standardized between different anesthetists. So, so when we're training anesthetists, so people who are brand new in anesthetics, it drives them berserk because they'll come, they'll spend a day with me. And obviously, I'm right, aren't I, Jude? You know, I, I'm always right. So if they listen to me, they'll get everything right. So they'll spend a whole day with me. I'll give them all my recipes for different combinations of drugs and how to do things. And then they'll spend the next day with Dr. Jones, say. And she will do it in a completely different way from me, from Mike. So then I'll see them again the day after and they'll say, oh, was with Dr. Jones all day yesterday and she doesn't do what you do and I'll say yeah but I'm right though um joking aside uh and I was trying to convey that with the history of anesthesia that's why I talked about the history is what matters is not necessarily precisely which drug you use but how you use it and the foundation has to be safety so the drugs I started using when I was brand new in 1992 are not exactly the same as what I use today, but the principles of how I administer them are. So we talk about A, B, C, D in medicine. So I don't know if you've heard of that A, B, C, D approach. Airway, breathing, circulation, drugs. All right. Airway is number one. Uh, without an airway in anesthesia, you've got nothing. So safe airway, airway, breathing. Obviously, without breathing, not much use either. <laughs> Circulation, well, you have to have blood going around your body, mainly to your brain, but to everything else as well. And then the drugs we use to maintain all of that. So A, B, C, D, E. And E is, E is, to do with assessments as well. But A, B, C, D. So there are a number of anesthetic drugs you can use. You can use them in different combinations. You can use big, bigger doses of one and smaller doses of the other or whatever. But what you have to do is maintain safety and maintain A, B, C, D, really. So there are lots of different ways to do it. And as we, as I spoke, you know, to do a cesarean section, um, it's much less common now to have a general anaesthetic for cesarean sections than it was, say, 20 years ago. So many of them were done with general anaesthetics, and now nearly all of them are done with what we call a spinal anaesthetic or an epidural. So, yeah, I mean, there isn't one way to do it, but there were, the fundamentals remain the same. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. We, we have Martina also. Yeah. Hey, Martina. <laughs> Hi again. One last question from me. Um, I think everyone is aware uh, of how, you know, medical schools are so competitive and it's yes. 
really hard to get in. Yes. And I was just going to ask you what makes a student stand out, um, you know, to be chosen and... Well, I have big arguments about this because I think the criteria that medical schools are using now, I don't think I would have got in. Okay. I don't think I would have got into medical school. I came from a very quite poor background, uh, although I was extremely bright at school I've, um, and I'd had awards at school and prizes and things. No one from my school had been to university. No, nobody. <laughs> Certainly no one had been to medical school. And even my careers officer said to me, I don't think you should apply for medical school. You won't get in. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you won't get in. So why don't you do nursing or chiropody? Um, so my 15 year old self said, do you know who I am? That's how confident <laughs> I feel embarrassed saying that now. But that is what I said. I said, do you know who I am? And they said, well, not really, no, because they just had a file in front of them. And I said, I've won more prizes in this school than anybody else. And I've been right into the British Medical Association since I was 11. And about 10 medical schools have replied to me as well. So I don't need advice from you about whether to get into medical school or not. Anyway, going back to your original point. Now, it's not enough to get absolutely top grades at every single exam that you sit. That's not enough to get to medical school. So you have to you have to have that as a baseline, not just as the, so you have, that's your baseline is A's in everything, right? So that's your baseline. Then on top of that, they quite like you to play a musical instrument or, uh, or have some special skill singing or, or, you know, being able to navigate your way through a forest. They like you to have done some volunteer work. They like you to have done some things like the Duke of Edinburgh Award, which you may or may not be familiar with, or some sort of civic duty. And then on top of all of that, they want you to go to an interview and show, oh, oh, sorry, I've forgotten. And then they also do like, IQ tests as well as your normal exams and also what's called situational awareness tests which are they'll give you scenarios and say what would you do in this circumstance what would you do if a boulder started falling down the mountainside and there were you know all sorts of crazy things so you have to be aware of what the so different medical schools have different admission criteria so they do vary a lot and obviously I don't know which parts of the world or all of you people are in so where you want to apply may be very different from the UK but I know about the UK and in the UK there are some medical schools that are much harder to get into than others uh, so some of them take more mature students some of them like to take students who've got previous experience in another profession maybe but still, it's very competitive. So maybe at your age, you're 15, aren't you? So, so start planning now. If you want to go to, at 18, so, so, sorry, do you want to come back up to me? Um, well, I've always considered being a doctor because um, a long time ago, well, not so long, uh, in 2014, I fell very ill to um, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Yes. I don't know if you're familiar. I'm very familiar with it. We look, and we look after it as anaesthetists in intensive care. Really? Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. And um, I basically was uh, in a coma for about a month and I was paralyzed for a year. And I had um, trachea and everything and I was literally just so weak and when I was in my hospital bed I always ask myself what do I want to do when I'll be able to move and you know if, if I'm able to move because you know it wasn't 
it's quite a rare um, illness, especially yeah. in kids. And very scary. And, and very scary. So it wasn't a sure thing that I was going to move again. Um, but thankfully I am. And, yeah. <laughs> and so I always inspired to help people, especially since, um, you know, I really saw my doctors as saviors, really, because if they weren't there, I, I probably would not even be alive today, you know? Yeah. So I feel this, that this aspiration really came from nine years ago when I really was in a weak situation and the only people that could help me were these doctors that were specialized and familiar with what was going on in my body. Mm. So... So, I, I mean, that's a very um, emotional and um, uplifting description of what's happened to you, Martina. And I think that for me, if I was on a committee, on an interview committee, and you display that level of enthusiasm and passion about it, that's the sort of person I want to pick to go to medical school. I don't care whether you've run 17 different marathons and you're in this boy uh, girl scouts or you know you've got you can play the piano to grade eight that doesn't that's all good but that doesn't make you a good doctor what gives you a, what gives you makes you a good doctor is like i say a scientific background so you've got to have solid science to be a doctor that you can't get away from that but you have to have mixed with that humanity and an understanding of the human condition. It doesn't have to even have been a personal experience. It just means some empathy with others and some understanding of, you know, the range of human experience. Um, so I wish we would go back more to that sort of way of choosing medical students. And I think that still occurs in some medical schools. And I think all medical students should be interviewed, for instance, but they're not all interviewed now. Often it's just gone from a piece of paper, what their CV is, what their exams are and that. And they never even interview the, 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 the applicants. So what I would recommend is I think you prob you sound like you make a great doctor, Martina, but also you just have to be focused about it as well because it's a game that has to be played you know you have to you have to play the system to a point so you have to do all the by the rules as well and once you're in you're in aren't you and then you can take it from there but you have to get the exams that's just the bare minimum <laughs> <coughs> have some outside interests as well if you've got time while you sit in all the exams but you have to have outside interests. You have to show that you're interested in the outside world. And then things like you, most medical schools expect a personal statement on their application form. And if you put something in, like you've just said in a few minutes, but in a more expanded way, then the people reading it are gonna um, be impressed by that. And I say that to all the others who are listening as well. All, all of you, everyone's life experience is different. And we've all got something to offer. And medicine should be, we don't want clones of each other, do we, as doc, our doctors? We don't want all doctors to be the same, the same personality, the same just obsessed by science and nothing else. They're part of our community. We're part of everyone's life, doctors. And so we want doctors to re represent society as well not just be some sort of untouchable group of people who you find hard to communicate with that's my view and i'm coming towards the end of my career now so i you know I'm, i've i've done much more in the past than i'm going to do in the future and i still love it you know it's an amazing job it's amazing it's an amazing job and it's a very privileged job but it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard as well. But I think you all know that, don't you? Yeah. Best of yeah. luck to anyone who try who goes for it. I, I would never dissuade anybody. My son's just started as a doctor now. Hmm. My eldest son. 
but my younger son, it, he could see the, the the downside. So he said, I have no way I want to do what you've done, Dad. <laughs> mm. But that's fine. He's happy doing what he does as well. But yeah, you know, society owes you all a massive debt. Massive. You know, I mean, we all have our part to play as professionals, but doctors are highly respected in the country and for good reason, held in very high esteem. Yeah, but I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's it comes from training and, it, you know, I can't do what you do. Uh, I can't do what lots of other people do. I you can't, can't even, sort a PowerPoint I out. I couldn't even get teams to work, you know, so uh, I couldn't get PowerPoint yeah. to work, but I couldn't get teams to work. Thank God Joanne was there just in time. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. you know, everyone, I, I don't, I, I appreciate the comments and the sentiment, but I don't view it that way. We all have a, a role yeah. to play in society and uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we are important. Of course we are, but you know, mm. so lots of other people. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's hugely emotional yeah. topic, actually. Yeah. We've all benefited. I've had my cesarean, you know. I've yeah. had my mother saved by an anaesthetist, you know, as well. You know, you just, well, you just feel so grateful. I, I can say, I can say this without fear of contradiction, that safety, safety for women in labour all of the advances, all of them, have come from anaesthetists, and, we, mm. and I don't, and I do, and we don't get the credit for that. Yeah. But they have. <laughs> that's that's yeah. incontrovertible. Well, I remember the face of the anaesthetist. I remember his face, and not the chap who pulled my daughter <laughs> from my abdomen. <laughs> So there you go. I, I knew who was keeping me alive. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I hate to bring a halt it, but we've oh. kept you for so long and no, it's no, been it's amazing. Fine. It's fine. It's massively appreciative. Yeah, um, I enjoyed it a lot. It was great. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, we've got some hand clapping oh, going I, on there. Well, I'll clap yeah. you back because you've been a great, great crowd. Yeah. And like I say, um, Good luck to all of you in your studies. The most important thing, whatever you do, is that you enjoy it. So promise me all that, that you'll find something that you, makes you happy as well. That's the yeah. most important thing. And this has made me happy, my job. I've loved it. Fantastic. Well, we wish you well, sir. And, yeah, thanks um, so much. and a, a good, safe... Um, a uh, few years before you retire, I, yeah. I presume, but um, and and in, and enjoy it. I'm okay, sure you will. Then. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, pupils. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.